Here. Mr. Gambiani. Here. Mr. Gambiani. Here. Mr. Madison. Here. Mr. Paulson. Here. Mr. Broman. Here. Can you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? We now have the pleasure of having the communication with our host school, Mr. Claypool. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wheaton Moral South High School. Those of you behind me, welcome as well. Um, this is an exciting time of year for any high school, and South obviously is no exception. We are in the transition into our spring activities, which means that the parking lot is full, even on a uh, otherwise calm Wednesday night. We have the auditorium filled with preparations for our variety show that's next weekend, as well as all the other activities. However, what is about to descend upon Wheaton Warville South on Friday and Saturday is a whole other matter. We are hosting the Coral Classic, which for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is probably one of, if not the biggest show choir event in the nation. And I'm not just saying that as a biased show choir dad. We will have uh, 25 schools here representing six states. We even have a school from Burbank, California coming to this event. Among the schools, 19 grand championships have been won by them in previous competitions this year. Three of them are undefeated this year. Week North is competing. Good luck. <laughs> it is. It is a remarkable competition. We're excited about it, needless to say, a little nervous, but we look forward to showcasing South and all the wonderful things that the arts bring to all of our schools. You know, show choir is an extension of kind of dance, theater, and music, and it's a wonderful opportunity for students with those skill sets to display those, those uh, talents on a very grand scale. If you haven't been, you need to see what the orange and black gym looks like for a show choir event. You would not recognize it. So we're, we're very excited about that as well as the, all, all the other activities. We're equally excited though about a lot of the things that are going on in our classrooms right now. What's beginning to take place as a result of the fit guide that I know the board has you know, some reference to is beginning to become very exciting. We have identified two different standards that we are particularly focusing in on in terms of that fit guide. Standards mastery and creation and collaboration. And as our teachers continue to embrace it, and we're not there 100%, I, I can't begin to go there right now because I have students behind me who will call me out on it probably if I try to suggest otherwise. But we are making progress. Weekly, monthly, by semester, we're, we're making progress in trying to create the learning environment for our students that research and frankly, in some ways, just common sense tells us is what's best for our kids. We have a walkthrough guide that we use in our building that is based primarily on the standards of those two pillars of the FIT guide that we use when we do brief visits to our classrooms to try to give teachers feedback on what we've observed. Now again, there are sometimes five, two minute visits, and sometimes you don't see a lot of the things that you would see if you were there an entire period, but we're able to give them feedback based upon the, those uh, items that have been identified by it. We see it also taking place in other parts, in, with departmentally, and I'm just going to name a few because I could name them, them all, but I don't want to take a lot of time here. Our science department, through the modeling that takes place, and I know that our board and a lot of people in our community have become increasingly familiar with that. Kids are working together collaboratively, remember the words of the FIT guide, collaboratively to create presentations for one another. They have to work together. They have to find ways to solve problems together. They are also creating questions that they can pose one another and their peers during their presentations. In our math department, we're starting to see uh, strong pursuits toward mastery of, of the learning of the subject matter. Teachers are teaching the content, 
by learning targets. They're giving them brief assessments, otherwise known as formative assessments. And sometimes it's as simple as this, this, or you know, in the middle. Sometimes they're quizzes, but they're trying to find out how the kids are doing. And based upon that feedback, they're giving students opportunities to learn it a second time. And then even have a chance to re, uh, retest or reassess. Now at first, for some of us, of at least my generation, you think, well, no, you, you didn't get it, you move on, or you didn't get it. How can you compare the performance of a kid who had two or three opportunities to those who got it the first time? Well, in our society at least, whether you're taking a bar exam or a driver's license exam, you get multiple opportunities to demonstrate mastery. And we're starting to see that take place in our schools as well, and it's exciting to see that being embraced. And a third department that I'll mention briefly is in our English department in terms of writing. There's nothing uncommon about the process approach to writing that's taking place in our school. Students create part of their draft, they share it with a the peer, they share it with a the teacher, they're given feedback, they go back, they revise it, they continue to work with it until it's a more polished product. Isn't that novel, given that's how the writing industry works on a daily basis? So whether, what department mean? And I just mentioned three right there. We are finding increasing opportunities for our students to experience those pillars, and I tip of the hat to Faith and her, her other folks who worked in that 50 I that is starting to, to, to resonate in our schools. Again, we'll get better, we'll be better next year than we are this year, but some great things are beginning to happen. But probably the most exciting thing that's taking place is in our freshman core program. Last summer, groups of people worked to identify students who weren't quite meeting the expectations we would hope for all of our kids. And they identified those students and began to assign them to different classes. We had eight teachers who volunteered to be a part of this program. To math, to science, to English, to social studies. Created two different teams. They meet on a regular basis to talk about these and other students, but primarily these kids. And every day they talk about what worked, what didn't work, what did we learn about this student that might be applicable to other teachers, because a lot of this is about relationships. And through that process, we, begin, we have begun to make some headroom. What they found out, though, first semester, it was a challenge. It was tough. They weren't making the kind of progress that they had hoped. In fact, it was quite frustrating. And in some cases, teachers were saying, I can't keep doing this. We asked them what they wanted. They knew that they needed to have their kids work together collaboratively. But they knew that they, as instructors, didn't have the skill set or the expertise yet to pull that off successfully. So, Aaron Axelson, who's here this evening, and Lori Campos put together a day-long workshop for our teachers to expose them to the proper way of using cooperative learning in the classroom, one of the most well-researched uh, best practices in education. Immediately, in some cases, literally that day, teachers went back to their class, implemented some of the things that they were taught, and found success right away. It has been a resounding success. Again, we're not perfect. We're not having the kind of success we will in two or three or four years from now. The great things are happening. And what's best is that word of mouth is spreading. The, the understanding of the need for collaborative groups and successfully putting kids together to, to, be, to, be, to learn academically and be successful is out there at Wheaton Memorial South because they practice not only academic success, but they also work on social emotional learning skills. They practice what it is to demonstrate encouraging behavior, for example. We have a learning gap at Wheaton Memorial South. As every school, large school, public school, that has a diverse population. We're not gonna close that gap overnight, and I think everyone in front of me and behind me knows that. But, with the things that I've talked about tonight, and with other things that are undoubtedly about to come, I feel very excited, as not only the principal of Wheaton Memorial South, but as a father here, that great things are about to happen because as our motto at the start of the year was, we are 100% for 100% and I think we're well on our way. So thank you and again, welcome to everybody. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Mr. Claypool. Are there any modifications to the agenda? Uh, I'd like to potentially table, uh, which item is there? Uh, the action item on, um, action item two, uh, 
regarding the Perkins and Will contract extension? Because we're not at the uh, phase of the meeting where a motion is appropriate, uh, all we can do is get consensus. If there's consensus on the tabling, it will be tabled. If there's uh, any objection uh, to the tabling, then the motion to table can be brought up when the action item itself is brought up. Is there a consensus on tabling it? Does anybody object? If, if there are any objections, just simply raise your hand. Oh, yes. Well, Joanne, since there is no consensus to table the motion now, uh, we will bring the motion will be brought up as an action item at that time. If uh, Jim uh, wishes to present a motion to table, uh, then we can have a formal vote. Uh, but since there is no consensus on Jim's request right now, we're just going to move ahead on the agenda. Uh, recognitions and achievements, Dr. Schuler. Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Claypool and Mr. Biskin to come back up to the, uh, the podium and uh, they're going to start. We had, uh, certainly as the, the board is well aware, we've got a great crowd this evening for I think a very exciting reason in that uh, we're celebrating uh, some of the achievement uh, of, uh, not some of, we're celebrating the achievement of some of our finest students um, this evening at both of our high schools and so uh, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Biskin and Mr. Claypool, uh, get us started and tell us a little bit about that recognition. Well, we're, we're obviously very excited and proud to have the uh, young men and women who are here this evening represent our schools. To be a National Merit finalist is a remarkable accomplishment, and I think sometimes at schools like ours, uh, we take these types of recognitions for granted, and, uh, and I know that the board doesn't but I want to make sure that we as a community do not take it for granted because what these young people have done is truly remarkable on a national level. Um, they're not only great students, uh, they represent our schools in very, very positive ways. And sorry to speak to Mr. Biskin too much, but I, I know that that's undoubtedly true for North, but they're remarkable young people. So if we could have Erica, you're the run of the show here, have our parents come up, our South folks come to this side, please, parents and students. And then the North students and parents come to this side, please. If I could ask, would you mind arranging yourself al alphabetically, please? <laughs> <laughs> Solve an equation or two before you make your way there. Trust me, I don't want to push it too hard. Okay. So we'll just we'll just go through this. Um, folks, what we'd like you to do, guys, parents and students, when your name is announced, if you wouldn't mind making your way to our board of education here, they would like to personally uh, wish you their congratulations uh, and. Shake your hand and thank you for uh, everything that you've accomplished and wish you well as you make your way down the road. So first off for Wheaton Mortal South would be Liz Bray. Before I uh, present the uh, Wheat Northside, I, I must say that 
the blue and gold balloons look very good here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> south. They will have more. <laughs> I wonder how quickly they'll be taken down, right? Uh, Wheat North is also proud. Uh, we have five National Merit finalists. Uh, I think what I'm most proud of with all of our students that are here tonight, they have a real desire, a real passion to learn. They are learners. They're not, they're not just students. They are learners. They want to learn more, they have the skills to learn more, and they apply those skills. So we are very, very proud of them. Uh, at this time, Patrick Bomer, give him a round of applause. Ellen Collier. <laughs> Allison Kroll. <laughs> Colleen Ward. <laughs> and Andrew Wells. Also at this time, uh, I would like to recognize Wheaton North Jr., Liz Spurlock, and her mother Lynn Pauly, and grandmother Eleanor Pauly. Liz was a finalist for the Prudential Spirit of America Award and earned the President's Volunteer Service Award for her charity work. Liz has raised nearly $10,000 by selling sneakers that she hand paints with athletic team logos through her project Custom Team Kicks. Through her work, she has sold 250 pairs of sneakers in the past two years, and she donates a percentage of all sneaker sales to benefit two charities, one that, one that promotes pediatric cancer research and one that promotes animal welfare. Let's give a big round of applause for Liz Spurlock. Thanks for being here. Parents and students, we're so honored and so pleased to have you here, and you're welcome to stay for the entire board meeting if you wish, but if you think you might want to leave right now, please feel free to do so. Next item on the agenda are public comments. The opportunity to speak to the board is provided for members of the public who have a question or comment on an agenda item. The board appreciates hearing from stakeholders and values their thoughts and questions. The board strives to make the best decisions for the district, and public input in a variety of venues is very helpful. The board must protect the civility and decorum of this meeting. Please be respectful for the duties of the board and the democratic process in your comments tonight. Please use the microphone and state your name 
and whether you are a resident of the district, uh, address your comments to the board. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Please be factual and courteous and do not include statements that are personally disrespectful or condescending to members of the board or staff. If you feel your matter needs to be discussed in more detail, please attend the board's chance to chat or present your comments to us in writing. We do have one person who signed up for uh, public comments, uh, Jean Shemlick. Did I pronounce that correctly? My name is Jeannie Kamelik, and um, I am a resident. Um, my sons Charlie and Thomas have been wonderfully served and are still being wonderfully served by District 200. Um, math education is both my calling and my passion. I'm in my 19th year as an educator. I teach sixth grade math currently in the neighboring district. From 2005 until 2013, I was a math specialist in that same district. And when I saw the agenda for this evening, I was overjoyed. I, I can't even, that's an understatement for um, what I see as being proposed this evening. These personnel, should you approve the action item number one, will provide much needed expertise. I can speak to this because of my perspective and the fact that I, I loved what I did for eight years and I missed students. So now that I'm back in the classroom, everything I learned and did is, has made me a much better teacher. I thought I was really good when I left. I, I was wrong. Now I'm a little bit better. These personnel, they'll help identify dyscalculia in struggling learners. They'll move children beyond math anxiety. They'll support teachers as they dig deeper into the common core of math practices and bring those alive in the classroom, not just content, but the practices. Do you persevere? Are you gonna to continue to work hard? Are you gonna look for structure so that you can use this repeatedly in all of your endeavors? So is it not our responsibility in this math and technological world to provide math learners and educators support as equitably as we do literacy? As a math educator, and as a literate human being, I would say yes, and I hope that you do indeed approve these personnel positions that are being uh, on the action item number one. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Kamala. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Dr. Schubert. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roman. I have uh, just a couple of things that I wanted to share with the board uh, tonight under my, my report, and uh, Faith does not know I'm gonna put her on the spot here uh, for this, but I think it's gonna be really easy for, for her to do, and that's, uh, I'd like for her to just talk for uh, a few seconds about uh, Friday's Professional Development Day, because it ties directly to one of the board's goals around uh, the, the revamping of your science curriculum to align it with next uh, generation science standards. And uh, it was a super exciting day on Friday that, that actually connected to one of the things Mr. Claypool mentioned even earlier about science department here and I think some nice opportunity for training. So uh, Faith, would you just give a board a little update on that? Sure. Um, Friday was really exciting. We had all of the elementary teachers uh, in the district over at Hubble. Uh, it was the kickoff of the next generation science standards. and. Uh, a lot of comments and emails that have come back that it was one of the best institute days in 20 years. Um, so a lot of excitement. We started off uh, with having Phil Kulkesi come from, he's a South uh, Science Department Chair, came over and gave a really good hands-on example about what they're doing at the high school so we could see the connection there. Uh, we also had uh, the men's a cappella group here from South who volunteered to redo three songs with science lyrics to kind of get us pumped up and energized about that. Uh, and then we had 20 different sessions, community members, um, actual engineers, every spectrum of how you could handle the science standards for teachers to choose from. And then the afternoon was hands-on engineering practices and where they actually got in and built the things that we're going to have students do next year. Because the key takeaway was that Next Generation Science Standards is all about students getting in and creating collaboratively. It's a lot different than reading about a science or watching an experiment and then copying an experiment. It's about getting in and thinking and doing. And there was just, there was a lot of great, great excitement 
um, and people are feeling pumped and ready uh, to get on to these next science units. That isn't the only training that's going to happen. I have a half day with all the grade levels uh, toward the end of the school year as well, but it was really well received. Um, Bridget Moore, um, my new elementary director of instruction, just did an incredible job organizing all of that. It was, it was a great day. Thank you, uh, Faith, and <clears throat> certainly heard uh, very similar uh, feedback. And I, I think just interesting to uh, to note, I wanted to start by, by asking Ms. Dahlquist to share that update. There are several items on your agenda this evening that, again, are coming directly from uh, the feedback that the, the board was uh, was very, very thoughtful several years ago in, in, in approaching that community engagement process and really listening from uh, from the community. You've got uh, that item on the science standards under your action agenda this evening uh, with the, the work around the master facility plan. Again, uh, I think something came directly from the community, the math coaching and intervention, uh, something that I think you heard directly from the uh, the community that they wanted to see for the schools, as well as uh, under your consent agenda this evening, you're approving a couple of things around technology as a part of the master technology plan. Again, I think you know something you heard um, directly from the the community. So I, I, you know, I think I probably don't uh, often enough do uh, uh, enough of a job of just making sure that we overtly connect the feedback we got for Engage 200 to the work that you're doing. But but tonight's agenda is certainly. Uh, littered with items that, uh, that connect to that. A um, couple of other things I just wanted to mention um, for the board this evening. Um, uh, we recently, actually, uh, Dr. Rammer just recently pushed out uh, a survey around uh, the school calendar. Uh, that was one of the things that, uh, that we had, had mentioned. We had some discussion at our teaching and learning committee committee around uh, a few of the things, the learning things related to, uh, to calendar, but one of the things that we did indicate we wanted to do was get some feedback from the, the community, and my understanding is uh, with that only having been out for a short time, I think there have already been about 2,300 responses to that uh, survey, so again, if you, you want an item that energizes people to fill out a survey and participate, certainly um, calendar is, uh, is one of them. Um, uh, we uh, also, I think, had shared earlier uh, that uh, through the, the work that uh, one of our Rotary groups did just recently, um, we, we continued with one of our food pantries. Uh, so the, the Noon Rotary Club this year is uh, part of their fundraiser uh, back in December, raised enough money to sponsor uh, a little over 20 food pantries. Uh, 13 of them, I believe, are happening uh, this year. And I think if I have the 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 figure right, um, with each of our, our mobile food pantries, um, we're able to feed 120 families um, within our community. Those are District 200 residents, and so, um, uh, again, uh, that's a very positive thing. Mentioned to the board on the finance side, we did receive our, our second uh, categorical payment from the state, so those are now fully uh, in and paid. Now we're right at the time when the third payment should be uh, getting released and, and they have not seen those yet, but again, at least that second uh, quarter categorical payment um, has come in. And then again, just uh, an update, we have a couple of uh, important bids uh, that uh, are out and uh, Mr. Farley uh, held a pre-bid meeting on our transportation bid. Obviously that's a big uh, service that has uh, great importance to our, our community. I believe uh, there were five uh, companies that attended the, the pre-bid meeting, which is probably a little more than, than perhaps we would have, uh, would have anticipated, but um, that, that will be coming. And then uh, we also just recently released the bid for uh, the cost estimating services tied to the, the master facility plan. Again, that was something that the facility committee shared. Um, I think uh, a meeting uh, ago, and that is out now. And uh, again, we held a, a pre-bid meeting on that as well. And how many firms? Nine firms, I think, showed up uh, to the, the pre-bid meeting on that. So um, all very good things. Uh, and then you heard Mr. Claypool mention the show choir event. Uh, also, I believe tomorrow, uh, Franklin begins their annual dodgeball uh, event. It's one of their big uh, community fundraisers as well. So. Uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon, Friday, if you're uh, looking for something to, to do, I think Mr. Gambiani you might be participating in that event. So stay safe, please. So, and that's it. Can I just ask a quick question? On the calendar survey, how have we, I, I haven't seen it, and I'm a parent, so how did that get out there for parents to be able to respond? Um, 
presented to uh, all the emails that we have in our, in our listing for, uh, for preparing the set. Blackboard. We sent it through Blackboard. Blackboard. So the sender would be. Okay. Any other comments or questions for Dr. Schuler? Hearing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda um, for today. Number one, acceptance of gifts from Lowell PTA. Two, approval of ACT expenditure for testing. Three, approval to purchase laptops for middle and high school staff. Four, approval of buyout of elementary desktops from lease. Five, approval of 2016-17 fee schedule. Six, approval of the resolution to authorize transfer um, for an repayable interfund loan uh, from working cash fund to IMRF fund. Seven, resolution to amend and restate the Community Unit School District 200 Section 125 Medical Flexible Spending Account, Dependent Care Flexible Spending Account, and Pre-Tax Premium Plan. Eight, approval of a 10-year life safety survey for the district to be completed by Leggett Architects. Nine, approval of bills payable and payroll. Ten, approval of minutes, February 10, 2016, open and closed. February 22, 2016, special meeting open and closed. February 24, 2016, Committee of the Whole, and approval to destroy recordings of closed sessions prior to October 2014 as allowable by law. 11, approval of personnel report to include employment, resignation, retirement, and leave of absence as administrative, certified, classified, and non-union staff. Are there any items board members want to move from the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, any information from staff, Dr. Schuller? Uh, just the, the one thing I wanted to mention on item two, the approval of the, uh, the ACT expenditure for, uh, for testing. So um, just again, recognize this year that uh, the state of Illinois did uh, put out a, uh, a procurement for uh, a, a college entrance exam. Uh, SAT did win that bid, but it has not yet been funded in the state of Illinois. And so um, we had built that item into the budget this year under the anticipation that it wasn't likely um, that there was going to be, be state funding should the state in the future choose to actually fund one of those assessments, certainly within the, the Teaching and Learning Committee, uh, we would have that discussion, but uh, our thought process this year was as long as they weren't paying for it anyway, we were going to continue to administer the test that we've got trend information on, and certainly our families have been uh, kind of under the understanding was going to continue to be administered, so I just wanted to mention that. Question on that. The, uh, if we fund that, the, we, does that cause us to have access to the information? Or if we didn't fund it, would we still have access to the information? Um, it, well, if we didn't fund it, um, we we would we would like we would still see results, but only from the students that chose to take that test on their own. So I don't think you would have comparable results because it would not be a universally administered test. It would be one only available to the students that chose to sign up and pay for it on their own, which would very likely mean you, you would not have, certainly at least in terms of trend information, for looking at some of the items on your dashboard, you would not have that kind of trend learning information anymore. Okay, so we'll have that trend information because all students will be taking it. Then. And that'll be during what I'll call a normal school day. Correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments for any of the consent agendas? Um, I just wanted to ask the staff to clarify um, the approval of the resolution to authorize a transfer from working cash to IMRF because I know there were some questions ahead of time about this, but uh, uh, it seems to me that, that you know, it, has there been a point in the past where we've not ever repaid this? Is there a likelihood uh, that we wouldn't repay it? Is it the same thing? I mean, I don't know, uh, when was the last time we did not have to do this transfer, I guess, is, is part of my, it seems to me we do some sort of transfers every year, and this is routine. Is, is there a reason for us to be concerned at this point in time versus any other year? Mr. Farley, you wanna answer that? Sure. 
Um, you know, I'll, I'll start with the board's fund balance policy at 25% and why it's so important. And obviously that's a cash flow issue as the district receives the tax money in September and June of each fiscal year. Uh, and then the state money is sprinkled in there sometimes very intermittently. So the, uh, the reason to have that, that cash fund balance is so important. We do uh, annually um, borrow money from the working cash fund, which is the equivalent of our savings account and transfer it to uh, separate funds in the school district. We've done uh, the education fund and transportation fund uh, pretty regularly as, uh, as a course of action. The IMRF fund, uh, we have done the last few years, and part of the reason we've done that is because we had an IMRF audit and they said we were carrying too much fund balance in that account, so we had to lower that fund balance down uh, as a result of that audit. So now we're, you know, things are a little tighter, so we do that loan uh, to the IMRF fund. But once the June taxes are received, we do repay all, uh, usually the June and September taxes come in and we, we will repay those loans and have to repay them by the end of the calendar year. So, uh, again, this is normal, uh, pretty standard. Uh, for the school district. Yeah, one comment I'd like to make as part of the finance committee, we've talked about this in the past, but I'm not sure that multiple years ago we approved it each time. Uh, you know, at each time we made a loan, and these are really loans, not transfers. And I, I, I personally think there's a distinction between those things, but you know, in reality, this, the way the wording is, and we've talked about it, and I think we may revise this wording in the future, but it is a loan. And it, be, it will be repaid from the tax money received in January, or in June, I should say. Uh, you know, and this is pretty much normal course of business for most school districts. And, uh, you know, because if you think of it in terms of we get tax money twice a year to fund our year. One, one comes in September, one comes in June, and we incur costs evenly throughout the year. So we always, really, in most funds, unless we have a large fund balance, have to borrow to pay until we receive those May or June receipts. It's just normal course, and that's why we have a working cash fund and a fund balance, you know, and why we can't deteriorate fund balance. If we didn't do this, or we didn't have a fund balance, or a fund, fund balance policy, we would have to borrow on tax warrants and pay interest and so on. So, you know, these are really normal course, but the idea is that we have to approve them all the time so that we are on notice that, you know, that it happens, and that's, you know, it's really truly normal course of business. And I think we'll probably, if when we look at the financial statement, I think we'll be borrowing more on some of the funds in the, before the year is out, you know, possibly. So I don't know. We can talk about that at that time. But you know, so this, you know, I can only say from the finance committee point, we talk about this and we've addressed this, and it's expected. Any other comments or questions? I'd like to thank all the members of the board for timely submitting your email questions on Monday and Tuesday to staff here so we get a prompt response and uh, expedite matters tonight, so thank you for doing that. I'm going to ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Kraft. I second. Seconded by Mr. Paulson. Mrs. Sender, would you please call a vote on the motion? Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mrs. Kaiko? Yes. 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 And the motion passes. We now move on to action items. The first action item is to approve the elementary math instructional support proposal. Uh, Dr. Schuler. And I'm going to introduce uh, Mrs. Dahlquist. Uh, let me make a couple comments on uh, on this proposal, but I just wanted to share with the board that. Um, this proposal is coming to you after having been uh, reviewed and discussed uh, at the Teaching and Learning Committee and, and they uh, um, unanimously and uh, I think with great support um, felt uh, the desire to bring this forward to the board. It really connects uh, two areas that the board has had discussion about in the past. One certainly uh, some of our achievement data around math and some of the opportunities that we've noticed uh, to address uh, some areas within our math data, and then two, um, within the professional development discussion and planning, um, a lot of discussion on how we best support our teachers to uh, address some of those learning opportunities, and so that uh, that really kind of brought this opportunity um, forward. So, uh, Faith? Thank you. Uh, the need for the elementary math coaching and also math interventions uh, really been identified through a lot of uh, 
sources. If you recall at the Engage 200 sessions, one of the things that came from that is other communities saying that there's a need to um, provide resources for interventions and also for professional development for our staff. Uh, we've been doing a, a good job of that at the elementary level with reading. Uh, we have not been providing those resources as much as we should be uh, in math. And you see some of those things that play out with that. Our park data shows that our ELA scores are uh, much more, uh, we have a lot higher student pr proficiency level with ELA than we do with math. Um, also, I've done a lot of work this year with our multi-tiered systems of support committees, and that's kind of the new verbiage for RTI, response to intervention, where you need to have not only a really strong core uh, and building up that, and that's why the need for that coaching, but also what do the interventions look like and who can deliver those interventions, and we're lacking in that area. So uh, as we've worked with that committee, um, they've helped to really identify what that need is and gone beyond that of what that support piece should look like. So I've spent time uh, with that committee that involves a membership from every single elementary school uh, and the principals to really think about if we were to move forward with math coaching and interventions, what it would look like. Uh, and the proposal that you have uh, tonight, and I know you've all read it, so I won't recap uh, all of that, is that every single one of our elementary schools would get at least a half day uh, coaching position. Um, most of that time would be at the buildings, but some of that would be with me uh, and with Bridget Moore so we can provide some continuity on what they look like and also coaching on how to coach uh, with that piece. And then we would be using our Title I dollars to, we have five Title I schools. Those schools uh, would receive a full day, so their half day person would actually become a full day uh, when we use the extra Title I dollars to provide that extra support. You saw in here already that with just the half day, we're gonna start off with primary intervention, K-1-2, get that really, really solid. Uh, the Title I schools will have a little bit more flexibility to work beyond that. Uh, and then if this passes and a couple of years goes by that we now feel that we wanna expand that coaching piece or move it from some of the primary grades once we're sure that that's solid, uh, that might change. But the focus uh, at the beginning of this is, is um, approved is to work with K-1 and 2. One of the interesting things that came about from the committee is the real desire not to just have um, coaching and the intervention piece, but be able to do enrichment for those students that are above the standards at grades 1 and 2 as well. Uh, so what the committee is committed to doing is increasing the amount of minutes of instruction in math um, from 60 to 75 for all of our students. Uh, that are in all day kindergarten, first or second grade, and utilizing that person while they're working with some of the lower students that really need that in small groups to differentiate and have uh, shared students so that we go above and beyond for our students that are above the standards at first and second grade as well. You probably saw on the last page, just we've already identified how we're gonna measure the success of this, looking at decreasing the achievement gap, uh, and also looking at pushing more students to the exceeds level on our own district math assessments. I'll entertain questions. I have a question on the, on the attachment. I, I'm just a little confused that, you know, talks about we're taking, uh, excuse me, we're talking about we're taking money from, not from, but we're, there's some new money, you know, we're netting a $15,000 cost is what's is stated there. It, it, but we have $332,000 of Title II and $228,000 from Title I. I assume that's not new money we're getting from some federal source or something? Um, we do anticipate getting a little more Title I money because our percentage of low-income students has gone up, but you're um, correct that it's a reallocation of that. If you recall, uh, we had used some of our Title I monies to purchase additional Chromebooks. Uh, and that was one of the allocations we had used that for. Uh, they've changed those guidelines. We're no longer allowed to use that money for that. Um, so while we had used it for Chromebooks, um, we're not allowed to do that anymore. And that same chunk of money then we would put toward this. So it's not that something else has to go in order to be in order to allocate this money from Title I to the math positions. Okay, so I mean, the, uh, you know, like some of the money was used for buying equipment that we can no longer do. But I assume that's not the whole almost $550,000. You know, the, I'm talking about the 330 and the uh, 228 
560,000. Okay, so I, my point is we're taking, I guess I'm trying to determine, part of it is we're not going to have, or we can't use it to buy computers, but I would have thought we, if this is not totally new money, that we're taking it away from some other place that we were spending it. And I, I'm curious what that takeaway is and, and so on, and then I have one other follow-up question. Okay. Um, with the Title II money, because that's the largest chunk of that, um, we have been rolling over some of that money uh, each year. So um, we haven't been spending the entirety of that each year. Uh, and then um, one of the things that has recently been freed up from that money, the teachers on assignment that had been working in my department that we pushed to the administrators for my director position, that chunk of salary can't come from the Title II funds anymore. So that's part of the um, absorption of that cost, but that had happened almost a year and a year and a half ago. So we do have uh, a chunk of that money um, that was not being utilized. Okay, so to understand it again, but the, even though it wasn't being utilized, it was available. I, I'm curious a little bit why we didn't ask for it in the past. But secondarily, or more importantly, is, is this a sustainable flow of dollars uh, going forward? I just want to clarify, um, where Title I monies, you have to use uh, all of it or within 15% of it or you don't get it. Title II, that money rolls. So it isn't that if you don't spend all of it, you lose it, like some grants, or that if you don't ask for it, you don't get it. You're, you get your allotment. If you don't spend it all, it does roll to the, to the next school year. You ask a good question about, you know, with federal grants. Um, there's been no word that the federal grants for these types of things is changing. I do think when we are looking at No Child Left Behind and it all being reauthorized, we don't know yet what all that's going to look like. But I do not see that funding for this type of thing is going to diminish. In fact, there's starting to be some things about if you're paying for coaching and, and doing that, that you might even get more money for this um, type of opportunity. And I guess the last question, we're, we're actually adding staff here. We're not moving staff that's teaching the classroom into this, this category uh, currently. Correct. Those are my questions. Any other questions or comments of the staff? Does the after, before or after school program, do they do um, help kids with homework and things or is it mostly supervising? Uh, it's just supervising with that, but you probably saw in here the extended day, that's a different um, program. So while there's the BASP after school program, that's not, you know, it can be a little helper supervising. We're also at our Title I buildings running an extended day, which we're actually targeting creating math lessons for uh, and targeting that instruction, which is different than the after school program. So I wasn't sure which one you were identifying. So. I think I missed that. So we have before and after, which is just kind of like daycare-ish. There's some academic components to it, but what is uh, briefly talked about in the document that's attached to uh, the board report is we're running an extended day after school, hiring our own teachers just to teach math and bringing in, we've piloted some math software programs and are, um, we gave a pre-assessment of where those students are at. Uh, and running that for an hour a day uh, after school with snacks um, and all of that to see how far we can um, make it with just the after school component. And we're using that opportunity to also pilot some of the things we would consider for math so we can judge their effectiveness. Uh, that's also for grades three, four, five. Each school got to look at their uh, allotment. Uh, we also provide transportation home after that is over. Uh, and they decided where their weaknesses were and also which uh, students and staff would be interested in participating. But that is a K-5 uh, project. Was there some discussion ever um, about like at the apartments with their little rec center of getting some help there. Did we ever do that? If we have uh, done that at some of our schools where the staff goes to the community center and provides that tutoring or the support. We've also done some things before school starts in August that we do um, uh, getting a, a jump start on school and some of our staff, uh, we've paid them to go to the community center and run um, 
uh, reading programs and some quick studies in math uh, to kind of uh, hope to recover what some students learn over the uh, lose over the summer so they're ready to go in the fall. Any other questions or comments? Staff? Not, not really a question, just a, two comments really quickly. I didn't have to commend the administration for always seeming to figure out how to do this without asking for a lot of additional money. Uh, I'm looking at the breakdown of costs and the sources of revenue, and it's very clear to me in, in this that we're making choices within our where our costs are going to reallocate some things to something that's really important to our students and our student, student performance, but also something that was mentioned directly in Engage 200. So I love the fact that we're able to do this in ways that isn't always about a new pile of money. And then secondly, just for the, for the audience, this proposal is not just kind of outlining the new staff, but there's also measurements at three different levels. So I, I really appreciate how those have been articulated at the different levels and tie into kind of measuring if we're being successful in this, in this reallocation and this time investment. So no questions, I just am very supportive of this. Uh, Faith, I'll, I'll, I'll support the measure. I just have a, I'm kind of intrigued by, uh, park data is very new, right? I mean, that's just one exam, is that true? Yes. So the question I have is, what, what data did we have before that didn't reveal this, this shortcoming, uh, this, this, this uh, short, uh, if you will, the shortcoming of the math need, and all of a sudden park data reveals this? I'm just kind of intrigued by that. I'm glad you asked that question because that isn't my uh, intent of the board report. Uh, I've talked with SLT prior to this year about the need for math uh, coaches. When I first came on board and we looked at, all right, we've got Common Core in both areas to do, what are we going to do first? Uh, looked at our own district assessment data, ISAT data, and what I saw from classrooms and knew that math was where we need to start. Um, so from multiple um, sources, our own data, ISAT data, park data, my classroom observations. We need more support in math. Um, I did cite the most recent data in the report with park, um, but that was not new news to me that we need to become better in our math instruction. In short, faith, the, the park data, the park information was consistent with the other information we were getting over the years. This is something that we had targeted and actually community engagement and really identify. Yeah. Any other questions? Just one more comment. I want to make kind of a little tangent to this, but <clears throat> we talked about it before. So there is a bill floating out there uh, in, uh, actually, I think it's right now in the Illinois House. Uh, Illinois charges uh, a premium when you use federal grant dollars to support staff, they charge a TRS premium. It's not really a penalty, it's just a premium that the state kind of kind of puts on to, to that. And uh, I, I don't know that that bill is necessarily going to get a ton of legs because for, the, for Illinois to reverse that practice, it means they punch another hole in their budget that already obviously is... Uh, um, is a little bit behind, but that is a good bill for us to continue to support because if that were to go through, the grant, the grant dollars that Faith talks about would go far further than they currently are. So what you're able to do under this proposal for $15,000 in uh, kind of increased local contribution would, would go way below that if we were to, to be able to use those grant dollars without paying a penalty. So. There's a relation there. We're gonna we'll keep fighting for that. I hereby will ask for a motion and a second to approve the elementary math instructional support proposal as presented. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Intower. Second. Seconded by Mr. Matheson. Mrs. Center, would you please call the roll vote? Mrs. Intower. Yes. Mr. Matheson. Yes. Mrs. Crabtree. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes, the motion passes. The second action item is approval of the phase four authorization of contract with Perkins and Will. Dr. Schuler. 
Yeah, so at uh, the last board meeting, the facility committee uh, provided the board with an update on uh, a couple of the items that were going to come to you this evening that have been uh, previously discussed within uh, the facility committee. Um, and included in that is the last phase uh, of the master facility planning process for this year. Um, so just uh, kind of at the onset, and Mr. Farley's gonna share a couple of things um, uh, just to kind of get an update on on, on what's been going on. But um, when, when we entered into the agreement uh, to develop the master facility plan this year, we knew that that plan had four phases to it. So this is not, not new information that we're entering into um, a fourth phase, I think the facility committee recommended that uh, rather than approve the contract all at one time at the beginning of the year that we break that contract into uh, to three phases this year. Uh, and so really phase one uh, that uh, was approved I think back in June of, of 2015 um, got us started in the master facility planning process, a lot of the initial data gathering as well as the identification of needs um, within um, each of the buildings, the development of the guided principles. As we got into phase three of the master facility plan, um, that was approved by uh, the, the board back in October. Uh, we began to then look at solutions to the needs that were identified and uh, there were actually three additional community engagement sessions where those needs were turned into concepts on how those needs could be addressed. Those concepts continued to get refined uh, and, and again if you've had an opportunity to uh, be at our, our community engagement sessions, you, you've seen those concepts by building and the way that they've gotten refined at the last session then uh, we, we began to put some, some cost to that. And so uh, I'm going to let Mr. Farley just go through um, a couple of, of slides with some uh, updates on what that's going to look like. Uh, we are not going to review all 20 buildings uh, this evening and uh, uh, the concept drawings with them, but just want to make sure that uh, kind of the board understands um, what that's looked like before uh, we recommend your action this evening. Thank you, Dr. Schuller. Uh, in your green folder, you have a copy of, of this diagram and being the visual person I am, I thought it'd be good uh, to include in the presentation to illustrate uh, the road we've traveled here so far in our facility master planning process. And as Dr. Schuler mentioned, we three, we had three community engagement sessions. I'd be have to go back. Uh, the board approved moving to phase three in October. So uh, as you look at that, that section of phase three, that really is a time traveled from October of 2015 uh, through uh, today as we asked to move to stage four. Uh, had three uh, public community sessions. Um, and I think it's important to mention, uh, in addition to those community sessions, a lot of planning went in uh, that involved time with our principals. Almost uh, a pre and post uh, session was held with every school uh, by the architects as they looked at and as we went through the process of uh, presenting the findings, evaluating how those uh, plans looked, and then uh, updating those plans and again those plans are still currently being updated we're still having uh, those conversations with our principals and our principals did an outstanding job presenting that information to their community and I'm going to show a couple of the drawings in a second and probably will not do justice to, to what those principals did as they talked about how it impacts their building both from an educational standpoint uh, and as we talked about some of the capital needs as well um, also worth mentioning that we had the uh, we had an oversight committee that uh, met quite a bit during uh, this time frame to, to put together these presentations uh, for the community, work with the principals, work with uh, uh, facility staff in, in crafting uh, these presentations. And then uh, ultimately before we went out to the community for these three sessions, we had our community engagement team. Uh, which also reviewed the presentations, gave their input, we made modifications, and then, uh, and then ultimately went to the community. Uh, each of the sessions was unique. We had, uh, again, principal participation. We had uh, an open house session that went, uh, we had at the third, uh, uh, excuse me, at the fourth uh, community engagement session. So it's been a long process that have involved a lot of people. It's been very public. And then finally, uh, as Dr. Schuler mentioned, the Board Facility Committee has been uh, key and integral as we've updated them on the process and what are, uh, in the direction of the facility master planning. It's been a uh, fluid process as we've adapted and, 
and tried to meet the goals of trying to uh, get that community input, uh, as well as getting to the ultimate goal of a facility master plan that we uh, plan to bring to the board in April and, I, and beyond this time frame and the schedule is obviously uh, the board's aware we've scheduled a workshop at the end of April to uh, once the uh, we're actually going to ask the board to accept the final document uh, to start looking at the, pl uh, the plans and prioritizing the needs uh, that the board wants to uh, take forward. Um, just going to run through a couple buildings here. I'm not, as Dr. Schuler mentioned, not going to mention all 20. And again, I don't think I could probably do it justice when we talk about it. But we uh, picked, a, you know, elementary schools. And again, we every plan we started out with, uh, you know, these base designs based off the, you know, the um, facility analysis findings, and then trying to again tie in that educational piece. And we noted, and I know this is probably hard to read, but I know most of the board attended some or all of the sessions. Uh, and saw the principals present out and talk about some of the educational things with collaborative spaces, LLC spaces, and obviously that safety and security piece. Uh, Lowell's a, a prime example of one of the schools. You can uh, look down there, number three, ties directly into that safety and security piece uh, for the school. Once we did that, you know, when we got to the final community engagement session, the cost was something, and the board also has a copy of the key uh, that uh, you know, we, we tried to put a range, dollar range, and again, this was shared out at uh, the last community engagement session, and, and we also included that capital uh, needs as part of our capital plan. You know, in that bottom right corner, you can see the, uh, the capital needs, and again, as we talk about that cost estimating planning process, that's where we're going to, we, we go to really tie those two together and decide what our priorities are. Uh, that, that capital piece is obviously a piece we have to uh, keep on our radar and pay attention to as well. So this was just a chart, and you can see it again, it's very small, but you can see we've, we've got those dollar signs tied into the different uh, options that were put in there for the educational analysis. Uh, moving to Edison, and again, as we got into uh, schools with multiple floors, we've, you know, different floor designs, SAPA type of thing, looking at collaborative spaces, and again, some resizing of some rooms with science and other things as you go through. The library at Edison obviously was a key item and again you look at collaborative spaces on, on all the floors and uh, right there on the first floor and the upper left is some of the science reconfiguration to uh, right size those science rooms and again provide that secure entrance so once people uh, come into the building uh, they, they find their way through uh, through the front office and we have some controls on those because in some big buildings again if you buzz in we do buzz people in they do have access right away to their building we have to direct them into our offices and Again, that safety and security piece is very important, and we've got the, um, again, the dollar signs attached to the, uh, the building as well. We Warmville South, uh, Dave's got his drawings right up, uh, he has them in the front of the building, but in the library here tonight for a uh, closer look for folks coming in. But again, you can see some of the uh, work. There's some things on Dave's list that, again, at South are, are probably future 10 years out type things, but also we have the LLC and uh, talked about how we can do more with resource labs and, and uh, some other spaces. One of the items on there, number eight, is the, the bleachers, which uh, we talked about at the last, uh, the, in the facility committee, uh, is, is being moved up to a summer project. So that's something we'll be bringing to the board here in the future. But again, we, uh, again, did the same type of uh, process with the high schools. And again, they've been more recently touched. So there, there wasn't as much uh, that is needed at the high school level. But again, there are some of those educational aspects we want to get to. And then again, uh, just including some of the, you know, the community was able to see and Dave was able to report out on what some of the costs are associated with it, as well as the, um, the operational costs there in the lower right corner. Moving on, finally, Jefferson. This is. Uh, uh, there were a few uh, options that we looked at and landed on this one to meet. Again, this is a, a design plan that shows Jefferson with renovations and additions to meet, uh, try and meet those program needs in the building. Uh, and I think it's, if you look in the bottom right hand corner, there was a range in there of estimated costs to do that work. Uh, again, this is one of the buildings that uh, had an addition as part of it. Um, and this just illustrates, again, the, when kind of back to the basics here with looking at what were the needs uh, and you can see there are quite a few again to add in uh, the amount of space and the right type of space to meet the operational or meet the uh, educational goals and program goals of that building again letting the program drive the design 
uh, of the building. So uh, again, a, a lot of work has gone on. Uh, you know, that chart I showed you, there's a lot of things that happened in between. And, uh, and uh, so we, tonight we're asking the board to move to phase four uh, in the process, which was, gets us to that final facility master plan uh, that would be brought to you in April, again, in front of that uh, April 30th meeting. Thank you, Mr. Farley. And just one, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, even uh, since our, fine, our last community engagement session, some of the design concepts that you saw even at the community engagement session have shifted slightly. So based on feedback from that session, based on continued conversation uh, with, our, with our buildings, we've continued to, to modify uh, uh, those needs in anticipation of, of delivering a report. So what you saw up there, um, we have some iteration. Uh, in many of our buildings, we're on iteration number four or five. Um, as we've looked at, at some of those, but there is uh, a, a design concept for each of the buildings. We did not, for this evening, attach all 20 of the most recent design concepts for the board because, again, they're still in progress. Back to, to that initial chart, um, the, the, the goal wasn't to show the board tonight a design concept for each building. That's phase four. Phase four is the preparation of the, the report to be uh, delivered to the board so that you can begin your discussion and work around uh, prioritizing. And, and I, you know, again, I should, should mention that uh, I think Mr. Farley, as he talked about the delivery of that in, in April, um, we're not asking the board to approve a master facility plan, certainly on the night that it's being delivered to you. Um, it's a report that you, you, you task us to, to develop and we're going to bring to the board and then begin the discussion around how do you want to prioritize elements from within that, that master facility plan and, and sequence you know, any, any work that, that you might want to address. So that's really, that's where we are in the, in the process and, and again, uh, our recommendation certainly this evening is that um, you give us the approval or we recommend that you approve uh, the, the development of phase four truly to not do that at this point would say that, you know, really three quarters of the way or more into the process um, that just means you're not going to get a final report uh, if we don't move forward with uh, that final phase. So, I have a, a, a question in regards to Jefferson. We have a remodel that's up there and a renovation. Are we also going to be presented with the option, I'm not saying that this is the route we should go, but I would like to be able to at least see the option of of a, a new build or are we looking at property of a building that we can, another building, a, a separate building that we can be looking at? Because I feel like we put out there a few years ago a, a referendum for a new building. Now we're not even looking at a new building. I just, I, I think to, to do something comprehensive, are we going to get that in phase four to at least be able to see options? And maybe that's the case for, for other buildings too. Are we looking, at, I'm not saying to build, but I'm saying options with, is that something that's coming out of phase, phase four? Yes, we are looking at, at multiple options. So again, I guess uh, the, the board has from, I think the discussion several years ago, you have a, a more than a concept for a new building, right? So I think you, you looked at, at a new building option. What we focused on to this point through the facility master planning process is a renovation expansion option that would at least serve program needs. It does not mean that's going to be your only option to consider. As we get into prioritizing of options, we are looking both at, at a new building concept that you already considered uh, a couple of years ago. We have looked at, uh, at some new space options elsewhere uh, beyond just right on that side. So, so to answer your question, um, in short, when, when you are considering or making, you know, prioritizing, you're, this is not the only concept you will be looking at for Jefferson. Right? It, it, what we focused on through this so was getting at least a base renovation expansion um, option so that, again, we could, could reconfirm, as you did last time, that you, you had discussion around Jefferson. You didn't just look at a new building option. The board also considered a number of other renovation expansion uh, options and, and ultimately landed on the decision. You will have similar information. Okay, and, and just a more follow-up question. And so with level four, we're going to be able to then have kind of a, 
a menu of costs per building where we're going to be able to kind of prioritize and figure out and, and, and look at a you know maybe an eight to ten year plan that's that, that's out there in my I'm getting to my understanding that's kind of what the level four is going to be able to bring us so that we can prioritize these are you know I don't want to use level because I've used phase four because level one and level two you know facility needs as well as some of the enhanced learning opportunities we're going to be able to kind of pick and choose and prioritize. Phase four is intended to bring you the information you need to approach that prioritization and, and I guess one last thing I wanted to mention on this is that um, the cost estimates that are on the, the drawings, the example that Mr. Farley shared with you this evening, that's an estimate that's built on a concept drawing at, at this point. That's the other reason why the facility committee recommended that we begin the process of, uh, of putting on an RFQ to look at some other cost estimates. You, you may not choose once you get the final report. There may be some items that the board says, we don't want to do any cost estimating on those. We're not interested in in those ideas. There, there may be some items that you say less affirm, you know, the, the cost specific to these items at, at you know, these buildings. So yes, the, the plan is to give you uh, all, all of the information, or at least a start at, you know, at, at, at the information you need to prioritize a plan in the immediate, prioritize, you know, kind of long-term how you want to address your facility needs. And Chris, to further expand on that, just for the record, so everyone knows, uh, we have tentatively set up April 30th as a day, Saturday, uh, for all of us to get together, assuming, again, assuming we um, pass the action item tonight, uh, whereby we would take a look at that uh, master facility plan that's been presented to us and start making those type of uh, decisions or considerations. Uh, I'm still a little bit um, uncertain again about Jefferson. Um, uh, and and I, I don't know if the phase four report will address this or not, but uh, you know, we, when we ran the, the referendum for a new building, uh, we pretty thoroughly studied renovation, and uh, after much uh, discussion and deliberation, uh, although it wasn't with a lot of community engagement, but with the with the board to whom the community entrusted our our um, uh, their their faith, um, you know, we decided that it really was not very feasible to do a renovation because of the fragile nature of the students and how would we do it over so many years and all of that. Um, is the final report going to provide then two options for Jefferson, a renovation, and what are we going to do with the kids in the meantime? Are those issues going to be addressed in that report uh, so that the board then can look at both options with a full understanding of the costs involved? Or are we going to be in the same place where we are today, where we, you know, we have a concept, but we don't really have a clear understanding of the true cost of renovation and uh, versus build new. Um, I mean, I think that's very important that we have that understanding, and I think it's very important that the community have that understanding uh, as well. Uh, I don't want. Uh, I, I almost feel that the community has been, um, um, you know, presented with a single option, meaning renovation, and if that ends up to be not feasible or not doable uh, or not the least cost option, um, is there going to be some surprise there, or how are we going to handle that? Because I'm, I, I'm not thinking that that's going to be where we land. At least where I'm gonna, you know, where I'm thinking I'm gonna land. Um, I don't, I'm not feeling really comfortable with that right now. Um, uh, how are we gonna deal with that in, in phase four, and is that gonna be addressed in, in phase four? Are we gonna get any recommendations? Yeah, um, you're gonna get a report. I don't know that the report itself is gonna say here is the recommended option, because again, I think that's really the decision that the board needs to make. Now, if you, you can certainly ask administratively our recommendation as we get into that prioritizing, we'll be happy to share it. To the cost element, we've certainly, the, 
the, the cost that we've estimated for uh, a, a renovation expansion option um, have factored in transition costs, the direct costs related to, to transition. Now, you know, if you're, you're doing a renovation option that takes multiple years to, to implement, there are indirect costs as well in terms of, you know, how, how do you program for, uh, for students. But any, any of the, the anticipated direct costs we've considered in a, any estimates that we've, we've worked with at, at this point. So, direct, are, are putting the students elsewhere, maybe renting space? to house the students in the interim? Are you considering those direct costs or are those the indirect costs? I, I would consider rental space to be a direct cost. And, and those are gonna be in here? Correct. Yeah, Barb, I attended the, the presentation by Perkins and Will with respect to the renovation proposal for Jefferson. And they, it was just one option that's gonna be presented in the ultimate report. And they addressed, one of the, the uh, parents there addressed the issue about well, what are you gonna do if you uh, with the kids during the time that this undergoing renovation. Uh, they described some of the things, but they said those were indirect costs. Uh, they also confirmed what Jeff has said, that the direct costs, which Jeff has identified, have been included in the cost range there, but he did acknowledge that they were indirect costs, but he gave some examples of what those were during the presentation. Uh, Bill's provided us just three slides from three different buildings or four different buildings. I guess the question is, why can't we as a board see all those numbers and information before we move to the next phase? I mean, it's there, obviously they've done the work, we've paid for it. I'd like to maybe, maybe to Mr. Matheson's earlier comment about, uh, I can't read your mind, but I'm suggesting maybe there wasn't enough information for you to consider what's going on tonight or make a vote on it, and I may be in that same boat. I'm just curious why we can't have a packet of that information, review it, and that might provide a little more sensitive knowledge about making a vote on the next step for me personally. I was just curious why we uh, don't have an opportunity to review what Bill's shared with us tonight for all buildings. No, there's no reason in particular. Uh, again, that, that information was out, out there and available at the, the community engagement session. We can certainly provide for you the most recent concepts that uh, that we have. Um, I, I, again, I guess, uh, uh, let me just be, be clear that whatever we would have put up into the, the board packet, some of them have already changed based on work that we've done you know, as a, as a follow-up, but the board can have any document that's been shared uh, with the, the public. Again, you know, the you, you see the boards that Mr. Claypool's got out here, we've got those for, for each of our, our buildings. We can share those with the board. Yeah, uh, earlier I mentioned that we might want to table this. It, it, let me go through the logic of how, how I'm getting there. And I, based on our can vote before, I don't think the tabling is the issue here, but you know, here's where I'm at on this. You know, we, we had uh, phase one and two, which we approved back in June of whatever. Uh, then in, uh, you know, I think last year we went on to phase three. And at the time we did phase three, you know, and I, these are right direct quotes from the, uh, uh, from the minutes. Uh, at that time, or at the, at the end of, let me go back a second here. Um, it says state that some of the work in this report will take place in phase three, if the board approves that tonight. Future community engagement sessions are planned in December and February. At that, at that time, another report will be brought to the board to decide whether to move forward on phase four or not, okay? And my point tonight is that we have kind of a summary document here. I think we have all the numbers that we, you know, are substantial numbers that are out there now. And I, I, I'm disappointed, I guess, in the, what I perceive to be the report. We set up this contract to have decision points in it. And I, I feel like at this point, I don't have anything more to make a decision than I had, you know, before. I mean, this report really doesn't tell me that much. And at the community engagement sessions, we've had, I think the first one I went to, we had pretty good solid numbers, or numbers presented. Whether they were solid or not, I don't know. But, you know, cumulatively, we have a big number we're building up to. At the last uh, board meeting, or the community, the whole uh, meeting, we, we talked about a, uh, another phasing, uh, another contract to deal with fine-tuning the costs, okay? So I'm looking at this and saying, are we prudently spending all the dollars we have available there? 
Uh, you know, number one, we're talking about 40,000 here, and I think the quote on the fine tuning of costs was another third. So now we got another 70 grand we're committing to. But we haven't addressed, one, the, what, the point being taken about, uh, you know, uh, Jefferson. I mean, you know, it, it's still to me, we have a conceptual diff issue that we have to talk about in Jefferson. I'm ready to talk about that now based on the numbers we have. And I, would hope, I was hoping that report that we would get now would give us that ability to do that. Uh, so I think we are moving to a direction where we keep just fine-tuning costs. And we're not addressing the grill in the room is that how, how do we fund it all? And so I, I feel like, you know, we can get, you know, a, a little tighter number doing this, a little tighter do, doing that, but we still haven't addressed the big picture issue of how do we fund all this stuff. You know, these are all big numbers. And, you know, I, I, you know, we've talked about we can't identify the number. Well, we've got identified numbers every community engagement session. So, you know, I feel like we need to talk about this more in the whole big picture sense. In that big picture being, how do we approach the whole issue? Okay, I mean, I don't want to spend, you know, 15 hours talking about the alternatives on Jefferson and not address the other whatever number we're talking about here, because I think we're ready to do that, and I think we as a board can focus on, you know, some of these elimination of some of these things, or you know, try to fund or decide how we're going to fund it, I guess is a better question. So, you know, I just, I feel like we're spending money to fine tune a program that we don't even know if we can afford it yet. And that's why I'm having trouble with going on phase four. The contract originally had decision points in it, and I think we're at a decision point, but I don't have the information to make the move forward. Okay, and, and then going one step further, we're now talking about another contract to fine tune it even further. And it, it seems so far ahead of where we are, and that is the funding issue. You know, you know, we can come up with the you know dollar projection that's going to be within two cents, and you know, but again, how do we fund it? So I, that's why I'm having a little trouble on approving this moving forward. You know, I, I I think we have some very big conceptual issues, and that's how we're going to fund this thing. We talked about it a little bit in the finance committee in the presentation by the uh, uh, the consultant. You know, but. You know, I just feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves until we address that issue, you know, to tune this up tighter and tighter. You know, we, we started this thing off with a, I think the term is the master facility plan, which is different than this master planning device, you know, the one that Mr. Robinson had put together, basically. And that, that one, you know, that gave us a big number. And then now we're, you know, now this whole process is giving, I guess, confirming that number? I don't know. You know, I mean, that's my mindset a little bit. So we're, we're kind of you know, repeating ourselves, but we still haven't talked about the possible. And that, that's where I'm really struggling with, you know, why should we spend another 40 and then another 30 to address these things? You know, I just, you know, until we know what we can focus on. If, we're, if we say our budget's going to be 40 grand, we've defined all the things that we can approach here. You know, and I think if we say to the architects, based on all this summary work, $40 million is all we can do, you know, give us a $40 million report. Okay, and that's, I think I need to know that before I would vote to approve this. That, and, and that's why I want, I had the suggestion of tabling it till a later date when we, we have our session on April 30th to talk about the focus of what we're doing. And I would hope in that meeting we have the ability to say we've got to fund it somehow. Because otherwise the conversation is worthless to me. You know, if we come up with a number that's not fundable or whatever, you know, that, that, that is a big problem for me. So that's kind of what I, where I was at on that, and that's why I'm kind of balking at, at this and, and would like to potentially table it or, or uh, you know, I, I'm not convinced I want to spend these 40 or the 30 thereafter until we address the bigger picture, and that's how it all goes together. Thank you. Could I, could I ask a, a question, and maybe this is what you were going to address, but um, can, can you, in a, in a nutshell, maybe define for us you know, Mr. Matheson, and, and you know, and I think maybe all of us as well. Um, what what are we going to have in our hands at the end of phase four? Okay, good. Versus what we have at the end of phase three. I kind of figured that maybe it was why, but I I sort of wanted to express what I'm hearing as as Mr. Matheson's concerns. You know, it kind of in my own words and in the own question I have in my mind. So it's all yours. So much I can talk. About. Um, first off, Jim, I don't know where the $30,000 number came from. I don't remember ever seeing that for fine-tuning. Um, I don't think the facility committee's ever discussed that. 
Um, how I watched the blog, and the blog there was a talk about another cost study, and I heard a quote of third. Was that the Tenure Life Safety Survey? No, no. Yeah. It was a fine tuning. You know, maybe I'm really. So we have a RFP, RFP out right now for cost estimating services and construction management services. The intent of that is when we get the final master plan draft on April 13th, which is kind of the, the individual needs by building, this which is still being refined, which is, no, the final report. Well, I mean, the report that would be generated by the report. Correct, the, the, the draft master plan. Um, we would then take that and as a board decide how are we going to approach and prioritize the, the immediate needs, long-term needs, how do we fold in the uh, deferred maintenance or physical condition needs, is, which is the capital facility plan we've had for a long time. That's the piece that we started with a year or so ago. Uh, so the, the way this will develop is that we'll get this f draft or final draft master plan from Perkins and Will. We'll be able to review that as a board. As you know, when I work with school districts, I never want them to approve a master plan until there's a lot of discussion about uh, other feedback, other ideas for Jefferson. I, I'll get to Jefferson in a moment. Um, how we go, how we develop the priorities, we give feedback to the architects to revise different pieces of it. Um, we'll have that conversation starting on the 13th. We have a follow-up workshop on April 30th. I'm, I'm understanding it's not tentative, it's set. Um, and that, that's, that's, we know that we can't fund the entire thing. We have a lot of needs. We're a big district, one of the biggest districts in the state. We've talked about that. So that's the, our opportunity as a board to begin discussing for a period of months how we're going to look at priorities, what different ways that we can package the work, um, which we think are, what we've heard from the community would be the most important things. And we'll, we'll go through an analysis with our architects and with our, our newly selected cost estimator to evaluate and put some more definitive costs to these solutions. <coughs> The solutions we see right now are very broad ranges. They're just like taking a square footage of, a, of an area and putting a, a general unit cost to it. We anticipate that the cost to estimate the company when they get on board will be a little bit more definitive and more detailed in not only what the cost estimate is, but also how do we do it? That's a big issue, especially at Jefferson. So we haven't touched really in detail on how do we do it. Do we build it all in you know, a, a fall and a spring and a summer, which is one thing we could do that's a little bit more difficult for that that age group versus do we have to move the kids and put them in a different location and how does that play in the different options we might see for Jefferson. So that that is this is approving phase four and approving the master plan or reviewing the master plan on April 13th is, is the culmination of what the community told us in Engage 200. If you go back to July 4, 2014, Engage 200 recommendation, I guess that's a the theme of the night, was to identify and prioritize district-wide facility and technology needs for the delivery of instruction and co-curricular programming based on 21st century best practices and develop a facility master plan to address them. So what we've been doing from June through April is what our community recommended we do. If we stop short now, we haven't completed that recommendation. Um, regarding the funding, first off, I would, you know, when you say establish a dollar amount and try to work a plan into that, that's a recipe for failure. I think the objective, the purpose of this master plan is to develop what the needs are, figure out what our priorities are, and then, and then develop a plan and a series of funding options to address it. We've begun the funding discussion back in January. You were at that meeting. So we haven't, it's not like we haven't talked about it. We looked at four different, different scenarios to, that would enable us to begin to have that conversation and think as board with different ways to do it. We don't know what the specific dollar amount is yet. So, you know, when we set out in this process last summer, the facility committee was lockstep in it. We developed a, a proposal with Perkins and Will. We aligned the scope with what we thought our available funding was. We broke it up into four, three different approvals. We did the first one on June 10th. We did the second one on October 14th. The next one is tonight. This is the last one. This is exactly how we laid it out as a board to get to this step so that we can finish the master plan and to deliver what Engage 200 said we should do. So we're following up on Engage 200. 
multiple times we've heard about that tonight. Um, so I, the way that's the way I see the process. We've been as a committee pretty lockstep and involved in how we how we go through this effort. Um, we're not there yet. What we have right now is not a completed plan. It's the up into the final step of that plan. In terms of Jefferson, um, you know, I kind of feel like Barb and, and Chris that what we've done here is just really develop a baseline. We've, I felt it was important coming out of the last referendum to relook at and reanalyze. Okay, so here's all of our needs for best serving our early childhood program in the district, which is in five different locations now, not just Jefferson. We keep talking about it's Jefferson. It's really about our early childhood program. I felt it was important to reanalyze that, come up with as good a solution as we can through a renovation and addition option and use that as our baseline. I have the same expectation that we're gonna go through and develop different options that we can see, hopefully that comes in phase four so that we as a board can begin to analyze what the solutions are, how we, how we could build it and construct it, what the impact on kids is during that time and, and have a good conversation about we're gonna make a big investment in that building to support that program and those kids. What's the best way? What's the best way to do it? That conversation will really start in earnest on April 30th and will probably go for several months and there's probably more opportunity for community input there even though we've had four sessions. There's probably more conversation and surveys and maybe it's a different kind of format to do that. So we're not done with Jefferson but I think what we've developed is a very good baseline that says, here's the minimum we need to, do, need to do to serve that program, and here's what the approximate cost is going to be. You know, I felt it was important to, to get to that new baseline because anything back in two, the mid 2000s through last year is, is, is old news. There's a lot of change in the construction economy. Any, any cost information on that is old, irrelevant. We needed to get a new baseline, and that's what we've seen tonight. That's what that process has developed. Now we need to begin developing the further options. So, and that's what we've talked about at the last uh, facility committee meeting. Jim and I shared some different options and we wanted it to get uh, developed. So, that's, I guess, a, a lot. And, and as I look back, I've said this a couple times already, this is all about what our community recommended we do. We made an investment in Gage 200. We heard about it on the, um, the, the uh, math program that we approved tonight. We've continued to do it in technology. We've done it on the community engagement side with some of the activities we've taken. Now this is fulfilling the recommendation on the facilities. So I think, you know, as a committee, I was, I've been speaking as myself, not as a committee, but as a committee, we've been you know, consistent, at least until we get to the vote, about what our, um, what our approach is gonna be in, in helping make recommendations to guide, to guide the solution, so. I believe this is the right step. I believe this is where the board needs to go in the next couple months. Um, I believe this is consistent with what our community told us. And as I think we, I think it's what we need to do. Um, <clears throat> would you say of that 40,000, uh, the biggest chunk of it is the estimator's work? <clears throat> because I certainly totally understand they're throwing, you put general numbers on things, but I absolutely would love to have the, you know, real numbers, because I don't know how we can go to the public without, you know, just a, a, a ballpark. We have to know our numbers. If you look at each one of those screens, they have individual numbers for, or individual ranges for each of the, the the targeted areas and at the bottom right corner of each of those slides there's a there's a range that says okay for Lowell school it's this to this so we have that number that's that's to deal with the educational alignment program issues that we've developed for phase two separately we have the capital facility plan which is a whole different set of numbers which often gets referred to so the master plan will put those two numbers together. It will be a very large number, something that we can't fund all at one time. So then we begin the process of looking at individual pieces, what are the priorities that we need to deal with now in individual schools, that we as a board can look at different options and have a continued discussion once we get through this point. But won't the range be narrowed down once the estimator gets out there? Yes, once, once we as a board say, okay, so, what happens if we do A, B, and C at every building? That package will cost this much money. 
if we want to do just buildings A, D, and F. I'm just using letters for them. Then this would be a different package. If we want to do only capital improvement, only the capital facilities plan and not do everything else, here's the different number. And that way we'll be able to look as a board at different options, different priorities, and figure out what makes sense as a district, what makes sense financially for our community, and have that conversation. So we'll have very specific numbers, and that's the intent of the RFP that's out now, is to get a partner to really refine that further and look more than just dollars, but how do we implement it? How, how we schedule phasing implementation over multiple years. Do you think by April 30th we'll have um, semi-realistic cost for a, a new Jefferson since we really don't, do we have the layout? I would anticipate we would as part of phase four have a, a, a different option for a new Jefferson or a new building that serves the early childhood program. Um, we might want to get with our cost estimating company to begin that conversation in more depth and you know it's starting at the April 30th meeting I know we, we need to get to a more definitive cost estimate so we can have detailed conversations but we can't get there if we don't do this <laughs> this is the whole point of the plan that we laid out back in June was to get to this point so that we can answer all these things we're talking about okay so if I can get back to my I'm sorry did you want to I can I can wait to get back to my question, um, so what we have now, first of all, we're not, we're, we haven't refined all the design work. Still we're still getting feedback from staff and basically, you know, what if we did this, this, and that. So, so we still have, uh, we have unrefined design work and we have very rough cost estimates. And and basically the 44 grand is going to get us to have a, a, a fairly firm design plan and somewhat better cost estimate and then after that well now when are, when are the cost estimators going to come in and do their thing is it, is it going to be after april 13th and before april 30th or is, when is that going to come into play? I'll answer that. There's two things there. So, no, they won't be done by April 30th. We'll, we will approve them to start work April 13th. That's the plan. And they would begin uh, working with us on April 30th to understand what our different priorities might be. The way we've written the RFP, there might be five different packages of priorities that we can discuss as a board. Then they'll spend I don't know, May, June, July, working through different options, getting feedback from us, reworking options, developing new options. This is, way, this is going to be a very dynamic process throughout the summer. It's, it's very iterative. So um, that's where the process of our feedback as a board begins to, to look at the different priorities and different ways that we can attack this in this one. Uh, in terms of more definitive designs, I just want to, yes, we're going to have a more refined solution but we're still at the very master planning conceptual state. These, these designs are nowhere near ready to, I mean, we're not putting doors in yet. We're not trying to figure out mechanical systems are very basic planning, high level planning uh, tools for us. And to just get back to the, the you know, we've had this discussion, you know, a couple of times before and I, and I appreciate, you know, wanting to, to start with what we can afford but I, I do think in this case because we can't afford much of anything if we don't do some sort of revenue enhancement um, I, I do think it is important to at least have the vision in hand and then if we back off from the vision and say well maybe we can reach that vision over 10 years or Maybe the vision's too high. Maybe we can't do, you know, green screen rooms in in our middle schools. Yeah, I mean, I'm, but at least if we have the, the vision, then we can back off and say, okay, um, realistically, we don't think we can fund more than 
you know, 50% of this vision, so how are we going to do that? What are we going to do and what are we not going to do? I, I'd rather have the whole big picture that I can choose from than, than um, you know, th than start, uh, you know, piecemeal. I'm just, that's just the way I like to think, um, so. In response to that, you know, I think you're describing, and I just heard that April 30th, we will not have the cost study done anyway. So when we meet on April 30th, we're not going to have that, that program. So, you know, we're implying that we're going to have it, and we're not. You know, they, we won't engage practically anybody at that point. So I'm not sure we're going to have a lot more fine-tuned data at that point. I also feel that we've been going to the community on whatever number of these community sessions, and every time we presented a number. And that number came from somewhere. So now if we're going to say that number is completely off the wall, and you know, I think we're misleading the community then. And, you know, so I feel like we have enough data right now to have a serious conversation about, you know, what we need to do here. And, and I just heard the deliverable on, I, I'm, clear, I'm not clear what the deliverable is on phase four. I don't know that we've addressed the question about uh, Jefferson. I, I, you know, where do we enter into that conversation to have this additional cost or alternative? You know, is that coming out of the cost study? Is that coming out of phase four? I just don't know what phase four vision is, because I, I expected that we would have an accumulation of all the community engagement things as part of the deliverable today to make sense of whether we want to proceed with phase four. And so I'm, I'm just struggling with what are we going to gain by phase four, because we have a lot of detail. And, you know, I, we're going to talk for, you know, an all-day session on uh, April 30th. I'd rather talk about the ballparks we got now and say, you know, we can't afford this or that, or, you know, give me a, we have to have some range somewhere. You call it what you want, a failure to be wrong or lose or whatever. You know, I, I just don't know how we can talk. I don't want to talk on April 30th about 100 different alternatives that aren't fungible. I can't say it in a better way. I just, you know, I think that we, you know, I, I just feel like we have enough information to have our meeting, discuss the alternatives that are going to go forward, and I'd like to then use that 40 grand to maybe fine tune some of those specifics. You know, and that's what I think we should be getting out of phase four. Because, you know, so that's where I'm struggling with the approval of this tonight. Well, <clears throat> I have a different view, Jim, and I respectfully disagree. I heard that from Brad that we're going to, the whole approach with respect to Jefferson during these phases here was to come with, up with a baseline approach. Uh, well, how we can renovate the existing building to serve the needs of our children. It may not be the optional pr approach, but it's, it's the baseline approach uh, based on current construction practices, current education practices for that age group and the kids with those challenges. That's Jefferson. Um, with respect to our other buildings, primarily our middle schools, there are substantial recommendations made through this iterative process we have gone through for both for Edison, Monroe, in Franklin, and um, community feedback has now refined some of that, uh, but we haven't gotten a final proposal from Perkins and Will with respect to our middle schools. I'd like to see that. Um, I don't anticipate that on April 30th, we're gonna have 100 different options to choose from. We're gonna have a number of different options to choose from, and it's gonna take a full day to narrow those options down and to share those options then with our um, construction management firm that we retain to give us some firm numbers on what those options that we've identified on April 30th may be. We get that figure back from our, our, our construction management firm that we've retained, and we decide, well, maybe we need to make a, a few more adjustments over May and June after getting community input. That's the iterative process I see we're going through, and I think it's a good iterative process because we're, we're engaging the community. The community's going to be convinced that we've looked at all the options, that we've carefully considered the price, we carefully consider the costs, and, and we just haven't assumed, for example, in Jefferson that we're going to go with a new building, that we've looked at an existing building and what it would cost to re renovate that existing building and taking both the direct cost and the indirect cost into consideration when, when we've adopted the final solution. Uh, so I support this uh, uh, motion. Uh, I believe we should engage phase four and proceed as we planned way back last June and be responsive to the recommendations we received from the community in our community engagement sessions of two years ago. Is there a motion to approve? 
on the XRI to approve phase, uh, implementing phase four of this uh, effort. So moved. Moved by Mr. Paulson. I'll second that. Seconded by Mr. Zantahar. Ms. Sender, would you please call the vote? Mr. Paulson? Yes. Yes. Mrs. Packer? Yes. Mr. Madison? No. Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? No. Mr. Roman? Yes. The motion passes. Reports are the next uh, item on the agenda. We've all received the monthly financial reports and the FOIA requests. Uh, after that, we have reports from board members. Are there any uh, committee reports? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let's see here. We met um, uh, back on February 11th, and Faith did the presentation for us on the math instructional coaches. Uh, we also talked about the school calendar and um, had asked administration to give us um, rationale behind um, different dates in that and you know, that we have within the calendar, um, you know, wanting an institute day prior to the start of school, things that were, um, that they felt didn't want touched, and then the other items went on to uh, the survey for us to look at. Uh, we were given an update on um, the science standards and heard a little bit about what was going to be happening at the Institute Day, as well as the, um, the FIT goal, which they gave the presentation for at the last uh, committee event, which was very exciting to see actual stuff that was happening uh, within the classroom. Did I miss anything, Mark? On February 23, the Human Resources and Policy Committee met and we met with Professor Jonathan Eckert from Wheaton College, who is our, um, working with our, um, our teacher administrative committee on an alternative to salary schedule. I'm coming up with that. Uh, Professor Eckert's an impressive gentleman. Um, he taught in District 200 for six years in the middle school, taught science. After that, he received his PhD at Vanderbilt in education. And he worked in the Department of Education, both in the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And his, his area of um, focus uh, while working in the Department of Education was working on a uh, grant incentive program the federal government was funding uh, on teacher incentives, compensation incentives. So he saw firsthand um, options that were being implemented um, to uh, reward uh, good teaching habits, good teaching, and, and as an alternative to a salary schedule. Um, he's written two white papers on that. He's now uh, teaching um, a professor of education at Wheaton College. He's already met with the uh, joint committee, kind of lay some uh, ground rules for the committee, and he's identified, he asked us um, at the outset of the committee, of our meeting with him, uh, why is it that we think we'd like to look at an alternative to the salary schedule? And both Chris and I mentioned we think it's financially, we can't keep, keep doing it. It's, it's, it's not sustainable financially. Uh, just to keep giving uh, raises to people for sticking around and teaching for another year. And, uh, and we also want to uh, mention that we want to compensate good teaching. And he said those are the common reasons for abandoning the salary schedule. He told us that the original reason the salary schedule was adopted was to eliminate any uh, possibility of discrimination either based upon race or gender of teachers that had been taking place before that. It was a neutral program. Um, but now we hope and we're at a stage culturally and as a society where we can get beyond that and really reward good teaching. Um, so we asked the teachers um, at the initial meetings why they got into teaching, what incentivized them to get into teaching, and starting to focus on where we can really truly uh, offer enhancements. You know, so it's just beginning. Uh, we got in, uh, some insight into the direction it's going, but it's just beginning. 
And he admitted that there isn't much data out there right now. Many of these incentive programs have not been in place long enough to get any trend data. Um, so um, we're going to be innovative here, it seems like. And we're going to monitor this process very closely. Um, the other thing we mentioned, and help me here, Dr. Schuler, you mentioned there was a Senate Bill 100 that's been passed that may have some impact on policy. Yeah, Senate, okay. Senate Bill 100 is the, the new discipline uh, policy, and actually Dr. Rammer is going to be bringing the board an update, uh, I think, at your next meeting, just on, uh, in, in anticipation of kind of the first round of policies, uh, handbook changes that you'll have to revise in accordance with them. We're going to set a little foundation at the, the next meeting for you. And also the General Assembly have passed some legislation that allows uh, middle schoolers to earn high school credit for taking courses that has to be implemented yet. Uh, we're doing some preliminary studies on that. There are some complications that need to be addressed with that process. Uh, so that's something we may be addressing sometime in the future. So just keep your mind open on that. Uh, items on the... Uh, uh, other topics. I'd be curious of what uh, what topics have been uh, addressed, being addressed by the Citizen Advisory Committee recently. I think we have attendance uh, periodically at those from board members. But and then in addition, on uh, this Friday, I'm uh, I've been asked by the School Board Association to uh, partake in the uh, Share the Success Panel Review Committee, which will be the committee that decides the. Um, uh, topics that will be on the November meeting for the 2016 school board conference in Chicago. And I've asked specifically to be involved with the master plan subcommittee. No. This is... <laughs> That's not true. I'll be looking at them all. <laughs> I would say the facility committee has no report. And just to report to the board, I was invited to attend a screening yesterday by the, uh, sponsored by the Illinois Education Association of a movie called Paper Tigers. It's about an alternative high school in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, what this school is doing for kids who are really at risk at the high school level is amazing. And uh, I looked at it and was uh, <clears throat> so amazed by what these teachers are doing at this high school but also so thankful that uh, we don't have the extent of that problem here in our district. It's just uh, a real challenge, but uh, it was eye-opening in many respects. Have we had any uh, recent CAC? The last CAC meeting, I think, uh, Barbara, you're at the, the last one. It was kind of in between the two community engagement sessions. That was one on facilities. Um, and then we've got one coming up a, a week from tonight, I believe, is the next one. Topic of the next one is uh, on uh, technology and uh, innovation, kind of discussion around future of instruction and technology, and uh, some discussion on where we're going in that approach. I think Chris asked the question last meeting, and uh, will we get reports of what, if there's conclusions coming out of those? I, I, you know, again, that's to me is a, uh, you know, an involved kind of spread out community uh, uh, engagement program. I really would like to hear those as we, as, you know, I, I know the first one that I went, of course, did with the calendar, and that, you know, I don't want to talk about that anymore. So, uh, but this one, uh, you know, I'd be curious to what the topics and some of the kind of consensus is coming out of it. Well, well, Jim, the one I attended was Jefferson. So the calendar, Jefferson, I mean, that was that was the main interest. That was what the group wanted to hear about. So, so that's what the administration, that was the information they provided to them. And they asked a lot of good questions. Um, and, you know, that was... But that took up the whole evening, really, Jefferson. Yeah, so. One other question about, I'm just talking about community uh, um, engagement. I assume that now that we're moving forward on phase four, we will get information about the attendees of the various uh, community engagement programs, because I, I don't want to be making decisions on without what I would call full breath type people. And I, I'm a little worried that we don't have that from some of these community engagement. I, you know, so. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that, that we hopefully have that data available to us when we look at it. Uh, topics for future discussion include the Master Facility Plan Report, Review of Staff Development Plan, and Review of Social Emotional Learning Plan. Um, we have our chat with the board on April 12. That date has been, uh, was originally April 19, but it's now April 12, 2016 in Wheaton North uh, from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. 
And our next regular meeting is April 13 at 7.30 p.m. at Longfellow Elementary School. Do we have any public comments? Yeah. Well then, <clears throat> there being no further action to come before the board in open session, and there is no closed session, I ask for a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Mrs. Antahar, seconded by Mr. Matheson. Mrs. Senator, would you please call the roll? No votes. We're adjourned.